Yeah. Next on KQED Newsroom, new developments in the Leland Yi saga and reaction from the Chinese American community. The highs and lows of the cannabis industry, documented in the new book, Weedland. It's going to be a long while before marijuana is going to be a reward issue for politicians. Plus, poking fun at the culture of Silicon Valley. If you want to live here, you've got to deliver. Like Steve. Jobs or Wozniak? Steve Jobs or Steve... No, I heard you. Which one? Jobs. Jobs was a poser. He didn't even write code. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Twee Vu. A federal grand jury has indicted State Senator Leland Yi and 28 other defendants on a wide range of charges, including money laundering, firearms trafficking, and public corruption. If convicted, Yi could face 125 years in prison and more than $1 million in fines. Other suspects, including reputed gang leader Raymond Shrimp Boy Chow and former San Francisco School Board President Keith Jackson, were charged with murder for hire, drug trafficking and other crimes. Meanwhile, concerns are being raised among Asian Americans about public perceptions of their community. Joining me now to discuss the latest developments are Linda Yi, KPIX reporter and Josh Richmond, Bay Area News Group political reporter. Josh, I know you uh, read the indictment. What's new in it? Well, there's one new charge for State Senator Leland Yee. They added a conspiracy charge to go with the six bribery charges that were already uh, filed against him in the criminal complaint that prosecutors had put in last week. And then, of course, there's that final conspiracy to commit arms trafficking charge, which has gotten a lot of the press uh, since then. Uh, today's indictment also uh, included charges against three more people than had been named in last week's complaint. Uh, other players in, in this large uh, alleged criminal organization headed by Raymond Chow. What effect is this having on state politics? It's such a huge case. Well, in the short term, it meant the, the cancellation of a big golf tournament. Uh, the, <laughs> by the Democrats. <laughs> by the Democrats, yes. State Senate President uh, Daryl Steinberg and incoming state Senate President Kevin DeLeon sent out an announcement on Wednesday saying that they were canceling the Pro Tem Cup which is a big annual event that's held in uh, La Jolla at the Torrey Pines Golf Course, wherein people pay tens of thousands of dollars to play golf with the most powerful Democrats in the legislature. And they probably very correctly thought that it would be very bad optics to be doing that right now. Although my understanding is they will be keeping some of the money that had already been given to them mm. in advance of this golf tournament. Mm. Uh, what about calls for campaign finance reform? Because a lot of this had to do with um, allegations that Leland Yee, for example, just needed to raise so much money for his campaign for Secretary of State, which he has since dropped, and he had debt from the mayor's campaign for San Francisco. Right. There are bills pending. There were bills pending before this. There are now other bills pending as well that, that would require additional disclosure of campaign funds as they're being raised and spent, that would limit the ways in which this money can be raised perhaps uh, in terms of the gifts that can be accepted, the, the, the ways that lobbyists can throw events for lawmakers. But ultimately there is nothing pending, uh, nor is there anything on the horizon of anything pending uh, that, would, that would limit the need that politicians have mm. for this money. Uh, ultimately, it is very expensive to, to conduct even a legislative race, much less a statewide election, which is what Leland Yee was now engaged yeah. in before he dropped out of the Secretary of State's race. Uh, it, it requires millions of dollars, and that means that these people have to be raising money every single day without fail in order to be competitive. Most people manage to do that without getting indicted, yeah. but occasionally some do. Yeah, but the you numbers... know, there is a problem with the most people. I mean, the perception out there right now, the, the public's, you know, they're reacting very negatively to our elected officials. They're saying, what is going on in Sacramento? So do you think they do have to speed up something? In... Oh, I, I certainly hope the public is incensed, and, and I, I think they'll continue to be incensed. Uh, in, in canceling the golf tournament, uh, Senator Steinberg and DeLeon said that they'll be meeting with 
uh, constituents this weekend instead and, tr you know, trying to talk to them about this, this public perception issue and, and about the issues that have caused this poor public perception. Well, I mean, they um, got to do and, something. They got to start legislating and making this impossible to happen again. Right. Three guys, you the, know, three state elected the, the, officials. The problem is there's no law that they could pass that would keep this from happening, happening again because this was already against the law. Right. Uh, the, well, you know, ultimately, it, it has to be, you know, the, the, yeah. there will be lines that will be crossed. Uh, you can set up as much uh, disclosure as possible to try to catch it as it happens, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But but uh, to, to try to take money out of politics at this point is trying to take water out of the ocean. It's but, just but, not going to happen. But certainly though, there are people decrying, you know, the fact that that uh, lawmakers can use funds from their campaigns to pay for their legal defense following mm -hmm. criminal charges. So do you think anything will come out of that? It, it's certainly something that they may choose to pursue. That's something that uh, that that people have talked about for many, many years, dating back to when uh, the former state Senate leader, Don Parada, was under FBI investigation for five years, although never charged with anything. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to move money into and out of his legal fund between that and his candidate and ballot measure committees. And ultimately, uh, although people complained about it, it can still happen at this point. This may be the straw that breaks the camel's back on that particular issue. And um, I want to take a, a look at the Asian community as well and their reaction to this. Um, you know, we've got Leland Yi, of course, arrested. We've got Raymond Shrimp, Shrimp Boy Chow uh, in custody. And what is the, the reaction that you're um, getting in San Francisco's Chinatown? Are they relieved that Shrimp Boy is in custody or is there still a fear out there? Well, OK, let's start with, with Shrimp Boy. They are there are people who are relieved because they he, you know, he's a recognized bad guy in the community. He is someone who has extorted a lot of money from businesses and from gambling dens. And mm -hmm. and, you know, he's a threat. He was part of that 1970s and 80s, you know, uh, gang warfare. The triad but, yeah, and the, the triads, tongs. the tongs. The, yeah. the watchings, the Joe boys, you know, all that was very much a very fearful time. And he was the head of it. He admitted it to me, you know, in an interview we did with him eight years ago about how, you know, he did all these things. But, you know, but people, you try to get them to talk about it. Hey, aren't you glad he's in jail now? He's back in prison, probably convicted. He'll never come back out. Then they wouldn't want to talk publicly about it. Mm. Yes, I'm relieved, but I'm never going to tell you that on camera. Why? Because they said Raymond Chow has a long reach. And that is our fear. As far as everybody else, you know, we've got Leland Yi. Today we had um, uh, Ed Ju, who had to surrender for the second part of his term, the former supervisor. Um, it, it the, is well, the former San, uh, the former San Francisco, Francisco supervisor, supervisor. Um, for perjury, and also he had served nearly five years in prison right. for federal charges for of federal extortion charges. and bribery. Right, it's the same kind of thing. And and you know the problem, the Asian community, when you hear these things, they're very proud. You know, it's a cultural thing. You're very proud when you have leaders of your ethnicity. Have, holding public office, but when they when they come to, when they you know have these crimes accused and they have to go to jail, it's embarrassing. It looks bad for the whole community. The whole thing now is there's this perception that all Asians must be like this, that they're bad, that they all they think about is money, and they'll do anything to get it. And is that because culturally there there is in many Asian cultures a sense of saving face, and yes. when when one person does something shameful, it brings shame upon the entire community. Yeah, because it's all about how people perceive perceive us as an Asian community. Oh, you know, I just knew it. They're just money grubbers. They're, they cheat, they lie, they steal. And when you have no, well-known faces like this um, parading in the media day after day after day, it, it's embarrassing and it, it looks bad. And you know, as you know, as being an Asian, it's all about saving face. Mm -hmm. And I uh, more court appearances next week, mm -hmm. um, Tuesday. And uh, this week, uh, Leland Yi switched lawyers. Now, why did he do that? And what do you know about the new attorney? Well, he, he had been previously uh, represented by Paul DeMeester, who appeared with him just this past Monday in court and uh, hinted outside of court that day at the possibility of an entrapment defense. Uh, two days later, he swapped out uh, uh, attorneys and he's now with James Lassert, who is, among other things, a former uh, San Francisco and federal prosecutor, and in that federal capacity had actually worked on an organized crime strike force. So he probably knows that, that of which he will now be required to speak.
All right, and um, Keith Jackson also now is represented by a very prominent San Francisco attorney, uh, James Brosnahan, known for his flamboyance. And he's already, like you said, also hinting as well as at an entrapment defense. So yeah. we will keep everybody posted next Tuesday. Josh Richmond and Linda Yee, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, what is so funny about Silicon Valley? But first, it's been nearly 20 years since California became the first state to legalize medical marijuana. The billion dollar industry is largely unregulated in the state and it's illegal under federal law. Still, voters in Colorado and Washington state recently approved recreational use. A new poll shows Californians are divided on legalization. Governor Jerry Brown recently voiced his opposition on NBC's Meet the Press. Uh, how many people can get stoned and still have a great state or a great nation? A new book called Weed Land by Sacramento Bee senior writer Peter Hecht explores all these issues. Scott Schaefer spoke with him earlier. Peter Hecht, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's been uh, nearly two decades since voters passed Prop 215 legalizing medical marijuana. And it seems like here in California, it's sort of the Wild West with marijuana being very lightly regulated, very little oversight. How did we get to this point? It's really a remarkable story. California was the first state in America to legalize marijuana for medical use and at the same time essentially allowed a billion dollar industry to morph and do so without rules. So. Um, it, all of a sudden, California has fallen behind other states in, regulate, in regulation, in, in tracking where the marijuana goes, and tracking where the money goes. Uh, we've just come off of two years of uh, sweeping federal raids on the industry here, and yet the feds are saying they're willing to step back in other states that have what they call robust regulations. Yeah. Why is it that California has been so reluctant to have more regulation from the top? There's been a lot of local regulation, but not much from Sacramento. Well, the irony about California is California tried to draft a law in 2003 that, that allowed medical marijuana patients to collectively cultivate. And what it was inspired by was a small colony of severely ill and terminally ill patients in Santa Cruz whose garden was raided by heavily armed Drug Enforcement Administration agents. But what happened is a collective became, in many cases, a massive retail-style dispensary handling millions of dollars in medical marijuana transactions. And as the industry expanded, lawmakers became very timid, uh, afraid to pass regulations, and law enforcement was of no mind to, to support that because they saw regulations as legitimizing a marijuana industry. Yeah. And we've seen just the opposite happening now in Washington State and in Colorado. They passed uh, legalizing marijuana, the voters did in 2012. Why, what did they learn from California? Why are they going about it so differently? Well, the two states do have their differences, but the main thing that Colorado did, and, and it be, be, because it was wary of California and wary of becoming the next California and California entrepreneurs going in there, is Colorado passed very meticulous regulations. All medical marijuana workers are licensed and criminal background checked by the state. They wear state ID cards. They have video surveillance that tracks the transactions and, and the grow rooms. The plants are tagged. Uh, the shipments are monitored monitored, um, and both states wrote those things into their, their laws that, uh, that legalized beyond medical use for purely uh, recreation or pleasurable use. The irony is that in Washington, you have a heavily regulated regu uh, recreational market that is about to open, and yet they are like California. They haven't passed rules for medical, so you have a wild, untamed medical market there that will, that will exist right next door to a not so regulated, uh, or to a very regulated uh, recreational market. As you say in the book, the, the push for medical marijuana compassionate use came out of the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco. In some ways, the research done by UCSF to bolster the use of marijuana. Um, uh, and, and yet, there's always been kind of a wink and a nod, it seems, that, uh, yeah, this is medical marijuana, but, you know, it's really for anybody who wants an ID card, you can get one. Um, was that a mistake, do you think, in retrospect, to, 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 to let it un unfold that way? Well, it was it was the evolution by the way the law was written, and 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 uh, Proposition 215, while it mentioned AIDS and cancer and glaucoma and 
and very serious health conditions. Also said that you could get, uh, you could use medical marijuana for any other condition for which cannabis may provide relief. Anxiety, depression, headaches. Right, and now the studies did show that, that marijuana has much wider benefits for pain related to nerve damage and all sorts of other conditions. But what, what happened was the birth of a medical industry, a cadre of doctors who gave out thousands of medical marijuana recommendations uh, for cash. And within a period of years, we have 1.1 million medical marijuana users in California. Yes, there are older, sicker patients. There are also a disproportionate number of young, seemingly fit young people that, uh, that have gotten the recommendations. There still seems to be this debate going on in California. We've got the governor, Jerry Brown, as we heard the clip at the top there, to worrying about potheads and stoners. Uh, Dianne Feinstein also concerned about legalization. And yet you've got Gavin Newsom, the lieutenant governor, leading uh, a commission that's looking at uh, legalizing it. What's, what's going on in, in, in California politically with regard to marijuana? as we sit here today. I think Gavin Newsom is one of the few politicians who sees a reward in advocating this issue just as he took the lead on, on uh, same-sex marriage. But for most politicians, they don't see a reward in advocating marijuana. They risk the, the, the wrath of law enforcement, which is a very key constituent. They don't want to be seen as, as siding with, uh, with stoners. So they may be a little bit flippant, as Jerry was, uh, or very determined, as Dianne Feinstein has been on this issue. So it's going to be a long while before marijuana is going to be a reward issue for politicians. You still in Sacramento as we sit here, you've got a, a bill that's being considered uh, to clamp down on doctors writing prescriptions. The police chiefs are pushing that bill up in Sacramento. So is there is that tension between legalization and regulation going to continue for the foreseeable future? Very much so. We're going to see a fairly intense battle during this session on whether they will actually finally set rules for the California medical marijuana market. And in all likelihood, we will have a legalization beyond medical use, a recreational measure on the ballot in 2016. 2016, so maybe a presidential year with a bigger turnout and maybe younger voters. That is the idea precisely. All right, Peter Heck, the book is called Weedland Inside America's Marijuana Epicenter and How Pot Went Legit. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks so much for having me. Well, on now, uh, to the quirks of the high-tech lifestyle, they're easy fodder for humor, and the new HBO series Silicon Valley premiering Sunday serves up a parody of it. Series co-creator Mike Judge has come up with a collection of awkward, geeky characters who think they've developed the next big app. Here's a clip from Silicon got? Valley. Okay, here it is. Bit soup. It's like alphabet soup, but it's ones and zeros instead of the letters. Because <laughs> it's binary. You know, binary is just ones and zeros. Yeah, I know so. what binary is. Jesus Christ, I memorized the hexadecimal times tables when I was 14 writing machine code, okay? Ask me what nine times F is. It's 75. I do not need you telling me what binary is, just like I don't need you thinking about soup or taking pictures of it. I need you thinking about apps, software, websites. This is Silicon Valley, all right? But underlying the humor are some serious issues for local residents. Joining me now for a look at the funny and not-so-funny aspects of Silicon Valley culture are... Arthi Shahani, a KQED news contributor, and Steve Goldblum, host of Everything But the News from PBS Digital Studios. And uh, Arthi, I just want to ask you, first of all, why do you think there's so much public fascination with the culture of Silicon Valley? I mean, it, it, let's take a big structural issue into account, okay, which is that everyone has smartphones, and on your smartphone, you've got Facebook, you've got Twitter, you've got all these apps that are made in a place. That, pl that place is here. So I think that's one thing, is that we see these companies, we think of the place, and the other thing is money, okay? When we think about America, the story about America is decline. It's the 99%, it's losing wealth. Where is there a lot of wealth in high tech? This is the land of billionaires. And so I think that that has people put their eyes here. You know, I think if you don't live in San Francisco, you're not used to it. But when you come here, you see there's young people and you go to startups and you go to coffee shops and they're actually not coffee shops, they're incubators and accelerators that are posing as coffee shops. I was joking with a friend that I think startups are the new law school. People that used to go to law school and just kind of hang out because they, 
they wanted to be there. They go to now they create their own startup and they have a few. Everybody has a startup in them. And they're yeah. going to change the world that way. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh well, Steve, you uh, yourself spend a lot of time poking mm -hmm. fun at Silicon Valley. Um, uh, you're the creator of everything but the news. This is a, a web-only spin-off mm -hmm. of a PBS NewsHour, and, and in it you play a cub reporter covering the tech beat, you're kind of fumbling, a little clumsy, but you get... <laughs> what are you trying to say? Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, you're great. Right, thanks. Um, but uh, I'll ask you more about your series in a minute, but first, let's take a look yeah. at a clip from a okay. segment you did on the rideshare service Uber. Hey, Travis. Yeah. How are you doing? How you doing? Hey. Good to meet you. Thanks for doing this. Here we go. This is Bo not bad. How are you doing, buddy? Close. We can really hug it out. Come on. Okay, hug it out. Hi. So where do you want to drive, Clovis? Close. We're driving where you want to go. Yeah. Who, whose idea was this? Mm. My co-founder and I were in Paris, and he's like, man, I just want to push a button and get a ride. I mean, he looks like someone and sounds like someone who came out of central casting <laughs> for a show about Silicon Valley. The hair, the flip-flops, the confident attitude. I'm changing the world. <laughs> right, well, we got lucky with him. Actually, he was the first one we got. So after he agreed to do it, everybody else would, do, would did it because he did it. Uh, an influence for us for the show was a George Packer article that ran in The New Yorker on the culture of Silicon Valley. And a lot of it was that, you know, these are apps designed by and for 20-somethings with a lot of cash to burn. Mm. And they aren't necessarily sa saving the world, but they're how do I get the salad on my phone ordered to me in the car so I can go to the club and do this thing? And these aren't real problems. These are problems for a certain group of people that have all flooded into San Francisco and, uh, you know. And, and that just raised the, the larger issue. You know, a lot of this parody is rooted in, in more serious issues that affect a lot of people and a lot of bigger questions now being raised about the current tech culture. For example, what just you just mentioned, all the fun apps. And, you know, Arthi, how much of the innovation um, are, are about things that will be truly transformative in the long term and how much of it is just, hey, a cool app that's trendy today but not so hot maybe a year or two from I now. Mean, I think there's a general consensus that most of what gets made is fluff and doesn't survive and dies out in the app store before it's ever known and some of it might be that unicorn that, you know, meant someone over a billion dollars. But, you know, there are two things that, I, that really contrast. One is, for example, that app secret, right? That's a, you know, blip, now it's actually going down in usership it seems, but that's the app where you can basically gossip without having to say who you are, but you can kind of see which friends unnamed are also gossiping. So it's kind of like this app that, that brings out the worst in human communication, which is let me, you know, spew yeah. out some gossip without personal responsibility for it. And that's, you know, like a startup kind of thing. On the other hand, you also have companies like Google Glass, you know, very, very well respected, huge global enterprises, uh, Google having Glass out. And Glass is, I think, like sort of either a really awesome innovation with only a few ounces of a computer on your nose, mm -hmm. on your eyeglasses, or it's just a specious thing that no one needs and will hopefully die out soon. And I think that that's like the bizarre thing that maybe gives fodder for Silicon Valley is when you look at what we're creating, we don't know if it's idiotic or genius. And, and it is Google Glass is interesting because it is sort of symbolic of this um, this backlash now against tech uh, that that it represents all the haves and um, and the widening income gap, mm -hmm. separating the haves from the have-nots. Are you seeing a lot out there? Because you're covering this, right. you're, you're poking fun at it, but you're seeing a lot of this it's and absolute, talking to people show involved is, in it. Our show is art imitating life. One of the scenes we joke with the producer, we beg for more money for our public media budget because we're paying 2000 a month for a single bedroom apartment that we have to share because everybody can now afford, if it's a renter's market, they can afford to pay triple the amount. Is yeah. twin bed? We were forced to push the beds together, and uh, you know we had fun with that, joking around with our producer. But, anyways, it, you know that that's true, and the other potent symbols of the income disparity in the city. When you see the Google bus plowing down the street, or you mm -hmm. see the person wearing the Google glasses, most people aren't on those buses. Most people can't wear those glasses, so it really does underline that divide. And another issue that's causing some resentment is the whole issue of ageism. It's sort of the unspoken um, secret, or maybe not so secret, if you live and work in Silicon Valley, that a lot of these um, companies, the startups especially, are started by young people. And they have said thing in, things in surveys, things like, 
it's really weird to have someone, uh, you know, my parents' age working for me. I don't, I don't, that's not someone I want to hire. I do worry about some of the coverage, though, in that, for example, there's like, you know, the, the, I think a couple of Sundays ago in the Times Magazine, an article about, you know, like the kids making apps and how they don't talk to mentors and whatever, you know, whatnot. And I have to say, I've covered a fair, among, a fair number of millennials with startups that they're not doing apps that want you to click and they're relying on mobile advertising. For example, some very hardcore cybersecurity startups that are dealing with some pretty, you know, difficult questions about credit card protection and fraud and security and things like that. So, you know, obviously ageism is an issue that people feel, but just in general, how homogeneously we talk about the Valley. I mean, we're talking about one of the most global places in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have never met so many Indians in my entire life, and mm -hmm. I'm from New York, but we don't see that here because we talk about bromance and programmer culture, and we forget who else is in the room. Well, there's certainly a lot of material here and fodder for the new series, Silicon Valley. We'll see uh, what the public reaction is come Sunday. Thank you both for being here, Steve Goldblum and Arthi Shahani. Thank you. Thanks. And joining me now for a look at other news we're tracking is Scott Schaefer. Hi, Scott. Hi, Tweet. Well, big news this week uh, regarding a federal grand jury criminal indictment of PG&E. This concerns the San Bruno blast that happened nearly four years ago. Eight people killed, injured about 60 people, dozens of homes destroyed or damaged. What does the indictment allege about PG&E? Twelve criminal charges, Tui, and they allege that PG&E for years knowingly and willfully violated the Pipeline Safety Act, that they didn't keep good records, they didn't do enough uh, checking of their pipes to see if there was a, a danger of explosion, and, and that they knew about it before the explosion happened in San Bruno. So those are serious charges. Each one carries a possible fine of uh, up to a half a million dollars, so it's a 12 of, uh, a $6 million potential fine at the end of all this. And then what is PG&E saying in response? And uh, is this going to be a tough case to prove? Um, well, they're saying uh, that there's no merit to these charges. They're very sorry about what happened. They say they're spending, you know, a lot of money to upgrade pipeline. This is going to be tough to prove. I mean, knowingly and willfully, that's a tough standard to meet and to convince a jury or a judge uh, that, in fact, that was violated, especially if the records weren't there. How could they have known if the records were missing? You know, all that. And pg &E, you can be sure, will have very good attorneys, and this is likely to drag on for quite a while. Well, other than uh, this potential criminal penalty of $6 million that you just mentioned, what else could pg &E face? Well, the state PUC has also been investigating this, and uh, they could levy uh, a fine later this year of $2 billion or more. So there's uh, several avenues of, uh, of penalty here, and this is uh, just one of them, this uh, indictment this week. Okay. And let's turn real quickly to uh, new developments in another story that KQD has been covering, that uh, beef slaughterhouse in Petaluma that was shut down in February by the USDA. Uh, some good news there. The good news is it's going to be uh, opening again on Monday. Uh, Marin Sun Farms, uh, which is already a producer of beef and poultry is reopening it uh, and so the these ranchers that have had to take their cattle up to you know hours 200 miles away to get their uh, beef uh, the, the, the cattle slaughtered they're going to be able to stay closer to home it's better for the animals it's less expensive and so on is it enough to alleviate concerns by uh, uh, ranchers well the concern they have now is that uh, now the slaughterhouse is owned by a competitor by, by a producer and they're worried that that's going to drive up price and reduce mm. competition all right, we will keep an eye on Better that. Better than the alternatives. That's true. All right, Scott, thank you. You bet. And for all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org. I'm Scott Schaefer. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Tui Vu. Have a good night.